run program fill cache loading 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 telescopic lens test loading loading typo check uh, error cache curl routine loading loading interview protocols loading loading speech operation system error 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 Oh, uh, apologies, Earthlets. Uh, a, a virus is making its way through the droid subroutines at, at the moment in the uh, 2018 Nerve Center. So I'm sorry if uh, if I'm a bit uh, coffee or grating or bunged up um, over the course of this throwcast. But welcome, I am Ulchar, your uh, your malfunctioning host, and uh, it's great to welcome you back to the 2018 podcast. We've got a couple of guests on this week. We have uh, Gordon Rennie who's going to be talking about his uh, series Angelic, which is running in uh, the second series, of which is running in the magazine at the moment. Uh, and that is uh, 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 the origin story, kind of, of the Angel Gang, um, which I'm sure uh, uh, everyone who knows 2018 knows. But uh, if you don't, then they were uh, a series of characters who appeared uh, and then were, the, were dispatched during the Judge Child quest back in the 80s. But have been revived uh, multiple times over the course of the last thirty odd years, and uh, the angelic is something a bit different. It's not just a straight uh, retelling of their of uh, what we know about their origin. So uh, yeah, fascinating to, to to hear what Gordon's got planned. We're also going to be talking to Michael Carroll. Um, Beginning of next year, there's a collection called uh, Judge Dread Every Empire Falls, which collects together his, uh, well, what somebody called a stealth saga of Judge Dread stories uh, in which uh, uh, a weakened Mega City One finds itself very vulnerable to those who wish to take advantage. Uh, a new series uh, playing with those themes and ideas begins in 2000 AD uh, and the Judge Dread magazine in January. So we're going to be talking to him about his plans for that. You may have also seen that uh, we have announced what's going to be happening with our 40th anniversary issue. Now, this will be dropping in February. It's uh, a special, so it's not just a normal prog. And uh, the lineup is absolutely incredible. We've got Judge Dredd, uh, written by uh, John Wagner. Uh, Nikolai Dante is returning for, for a special story. Robbie Morris and Simon Fraser. We've got uh, Slain by Pat Mills and Simon Davis. Robusters, Seeing Red by Pat Mills and Clint Langley. Uh, Zombo, which is uh, Al Ewing and Henry Flint's uh, weaponized zombie is uh, is returning, and uh, we've got a, a new creative team on the Durham Red a uh, story called Judas Strain by Lauren Bucus and Dale Halverson, uh, which is being drawn by uh, Carlos Esquera. You may remember uh, Lauren and Dale were our guests earlier this year on the Thrillcast, both big fans, and it's great to see them uh, not only coming to the two, coming to 2000 AD uh, to write for us, but also uh, helping revive uh, Darren Red, one of our uh, very popular characters. So uh, the 40th anniversary issue will be out in February in uh, print and digital, and also... You can expect to see work from Jock, Dave Gibbons, and Brian Talbot in that issue. So uh, definitely one to grab hold of. Speaking of our 40th anniversary, uh, if you have not bought your tickets for the uh, 40th anniversary convention on the 11th of February, taking place in Hammersmith in London, then do so at once. It's an incredible lineup of characters. We're going to have panels. We're going to have uh, various things ha happening on the day. Don't want to uh, give away too much just yet because we've got some big announcements coming up uh, over the uh, over the next few weeks. So uh, get along to uh, 2000 AD online.com forward slash 40 years. That's four zero years. And uh, make sure you book your tickets for uh, what promises to be the galaxy's greatest show. So let's get on with the interviews. Um, our chat with Gordon Rennie about uh, Angelic comes at a good time because uh, Fink Angel Legacy is uh, a new collection that's out this month. Uh, collects together the uh, the Fink stories as well as the uh, the stories of his son Rat Fink. Um, Angel Gang, very very popular series of characters. So popular, in fact, that they've uh, they were revived from the grave after the uh, Judge Child Quest. Um, Angelic is uh, running in the Judge Dead magazine uh, at the moment, and it's all about evil and how 
people uh, become the psychopaths that we know, but perhaps in a new and surprising way, and uh, really takes uh, the character of Par Angel, uh, which Gordon will talk about in a minute, and uh, yeah, does something a little bit different. Great, great artwork by Lee Carter, really atmospheric. Um, so yeah, it's great to welcome Gordon back onto the Thrillcast. Oh, hi, mate. Hi, thanks. No worries. Um, so, Angelic, um, talk about the origin of, the, of, of this series, because I was, I was talking to, to um, Matt, our editor, and um, he said that uh, you drew some inspiration from uh, the, 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 the Hannibal TV series. Yeah, that's right. I was, I was a big fan of Hannibal. Well, up until the third series, when I absolutely lost the plot of what was going on. <laughs> but I liked the idea that they played about with continuity really early on in the first series. Uh, there was little hints that it wasn't actually in continuity with the uh, you know what we, what we knew from the movies. Mm. Uh, one character changed gender, one character changed race. But these are for minor things. The second series uh, became really obvious where it was going off in its own continuity completely, you know, alternate timeline. Yeah, uh, and I thought it'd be interesting to do that with uh, a character in two thousand AD, one that's been, I think, not particularly well served. Um, you know, in the past, uh, so I decided on the Angel Gang and specifically a Pat Angel. Mm. Um, they've always been kind of, you know, comedy redneck psychos, and that that kind of ran into the ground, I think, in the end, which is why we've not seen them in years and years. And I think John's pensioned or killed them all off. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to go back to the origins of them and try and do a different take. Basically, do Pat Angel as the hero, not the villain. Right, right, of okay. Because because you, you you did a whole slew of. Um... Uh, me Machine Angel stories. Um, yeah, well, it was Me Machine. Yeah, they yeah. were just in the usual kind of like comedy psycho vein. Mm. You know, I think that's that's played out with those characters now. I'd like to do something more sort of mature and serious and interesting with them. Sure, sure. And um, so far, we've only met Par Angel. And uh, the, yeah, he's, well, he's uh, not even called. I never, call, he's never ever called Pi Angel. Uh, you don't see the scripts, of course. So you just yeah. don't. He's just called Angel. So it's always, a, it's also it's an important differentiation. Is that a word? I don't know. Um, <laughs> that uh, that we don't call him that. He's not necessarily Pi Angel. He's just Angel mm. or Mister Angel. It, it, uh, I don't want. I don't, I don't actually like calling him Pi Angel at all. I, I, I know it's people do it in reviews. It's, naturally, of course, they do. But he's not actually Pi Angel. He's someone slightly different. Right, right, okay. If that makes sense. Well, I, I mean, to, to, uh, well, to a certain extent, he's the family isn't together yet. He's not yet the the patriarch yes, of, of that yeah, family. He's, he's just a different character. He's not the, uh, the the kind of horrible, evil, psychotic patriarch we see later on, and he might not become that character. Right, which is an important thing in the story as well. It's an it's, it's an alternate timeline where these things might not happen. Well, it, I mean, that, that, that's that's an interesting uh, angle. The the, the idea of uh, not humanising these, these these characters, but explaining them to a certain extent. Yes, yes, I wanted to do. I just I wanted to show why he might have become like that. Uh, uh, it's all about the family and his background, which he's lost his memories. He's a Texas City gangster who was shot in the head by corrupt judges and has basically lost his memories, rebuilding his life and rebuilding a family that he's lost as well in mm. Texas City. His wife and child were killed, uh, so he's basically searching for a new family. So that's the sort of uh, that's the core of the character is family and protecting those around him, mm. it, it, which makes him a much more human character. Yeah, it, it, even even when uh, uh, sort of bringing that family together essentially brings together some of the most evil people you can imagine. Well, it might go that way, or mm. it might not. Okay, okay. Interesting. <laughs> this isn't a definitive origin of of the angel family, which is why like, even the title uh, is angelic, is angel like, is what angelic means, not necessarily an angel. Uh, right. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, you can't really dismiss the series. You're going well. We know how that ends up because, as far as you're concerned, no. Yes. Might not uh, go that way. In the very first series, um, there's a psyker character who talk, who can see the future, but he says the future's changing. He sees the judge child and things like that. But it's all shifting. It might not happen that way. Mm, okay, okay. Which um, is the purpose of the story. Because this, the, I mean, this isn't your your first rodeo, so to speak. You know, you, you've, you've done a lot of series set in this kind of um, uh, pseudo wild west of, of of the cursed earth, and bringing in elements from Texas City. Because you you did uh, Mission yeah. Missionary Man and um, Cursed, cursed Earth Coburn. Coburn and things like that. So uh, w w explain what your fascination is, not just with the cursed earth, but with this this kind of um, uh, southern stereotype of 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 uh, you know lawless rednecks. 
Uh, I don't know if it's a fascination, but I do keep on coming back to it. I mean, mm. I've always, it's, yeah, as you point out, there's always been a, I've always done a series set in that, you know, milieu. Uh, my rule is to, only to do one at a time, so I didn't do, never did Mystery Man and Crusty Earth Coburn at a time. <laughs> Crusty Earth Coburn's been p- pensioned off, so we never get in jail. The rule is never do more than one of these series at a time. Right, right. Uh, I don't know why I keep on coming back to it, to be honest. I do like the Crusty Earth as a setting, so I've always, from the very beginning of my work for 2000 AD, the magazine, I've always been the Cursed Earth. Mm. Uh, I like it as a sort of primal, apocalyptic, almost Old Testament-like landscape, which I think Westerns are very much about as well. Well, that's, that's the thing, isn't it? That, that so many of the of, of the tropes of the Cursed Earth are now essentially Western tropes. That, that uh, yes. you, know, you, you used to be a place um, uh, where anything went, so you'd have dinosaurs and volcanoes and then you know glass cities that melted and things like that but but now it's very firmly a a, 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 a kind of future wild west yeah yeah john and john wagner was pat mills made it kind of crazy and weird mm-hmm. uh, but john kind of roped it into a, a very sort of western setting there's you know se- settlements and plantations and uh you know herds of uh animals being you know, with cowboys and things like that. Mm-hmm. And and with, with, with the Angel Gang, I mean, you mentioned earlier um, about the fact you don't think they've been particularly well served. What what is it about the characters of the Angel Gang that you that you like? Uh, well, I, I always did, I always did quite like the comedy redneck thing, but that that only went so far. Mm. Uh, I think with me, Machine, I'm part of the problem. He tipped too far to comedy. He just became a caricature, really. Uh, he's not a particularly deep character, to be fair, you know. So I think it was fair enough when John pensioned him off in the strip. Mm. Uh, but we don't really know much about the rest of the Angel Gang, which is why I wanted to go back to them. Uh, and especially, with, sorry, especially with Pa, who's a you know, it just seems to be this horrible, evil patriarch. And I thought I wanted to do more with them. Is is the the extreme violence and the, the viciousness of them? Is is that an appealing thing as a writer that you can kind of let loose and 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 do really quite nasty things? Uh, it is it is a violent strip. The first mm. series is very violent. Pag gets, or Angel gets tortured, and the second series he meets this uh, other family who are basically a, a future version of the Angel. He's getting a vision of his own future. Right. They're basically, the Angel gang, uh, and he gets very nasty towards the end. Uh, he's a very very violent character. I mean, that's that's why he becomes what he becomes. Mm. Uh, but the moment he has this moral core that reigns in the violence, or, or um, gives it a reason. Okay. Uh, he, he only does bas- nasty things to people who are worse than him at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's how he, that's how he stays at the side of the angels. Right. Right. Okay. So, so is is, is it a kind of uh, the more you kind of you know tread in in the mud, the muddier you get, kind of thing. Yes. Yeah. So whether you see which way he'll fall in the end, right, okay. or if he will fall. Let, let's talk a little bit about Lee Carter's uh, artwork on the series because he, he he's he's got quite a, 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 a well he has a unique style in 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 that it's he uses uh, computers but uh, it doesn't result in things feeling all that stiff you know there's a there's a lot of detail no, it, there. yeah it doesn't it doesn't look all photoshoppy which mm. you know some of this that kind of artwork does I feel. Uh, yeah, no, it's been great working with Lee. He sent me a, he mapped out the entire, uh, the, the second series takes, a lot of it takes place in this ranch where the bad guys live, the mm. Creek family or this surrogate angel family. And he mapped out the entire thing uh, digitally. He built it as a digital model. So I thought, well, we better start using this. <laughs> He's put hours and hours in to build this thing. Uh, so that was very impressive. And I can actually see the, uh, what the setting looked like, you know, before uh, I think I'd done the first episode at this point, uh, but the remaining episodes, I could see what the location looked like, mm. uh, which was really impressive. Uh, no, it's great working with Lee. Um, I mean, it started. I can't remember. I I met. I never. I, I hadn't worked with him in comics before. I'd worked with him in computer games. He used to work at a games company in Liverpool as an artist. Who mm. I did some work for there, so that's how I got to know him. Uh, and then I knew he wanted to do comics. And there is doing comics, so uh, good for him. <laughs> uh, yeah, it started with um, I, I talked to him. He produced this amazing uh, sketch character concept for him, and it was basically Yujimbo, or no, it wasn't Yujimbo. It was Baby Cart. Hmm. Uh, it was in this old kind of warrior kite cat guy carrying a kid in his shoulders, and that was that was Angel and uh, his adopted son Link. Hmm. So that was kind of like the samurai with baby kind of feel we're going for. 
And that sort of really sparked it all off in my imagination after talking to him about it. Because, because I mean, that's that's the opening page of of the first episode of the first series. Yes, isn't that, it? that was that was that was going to be the image that really sort of defined the story. I thought. Mm. Um, with the uh, with Lee's stuff, uh, as the first series went on, and now that we're into the second, um, uh, are you both? On the same page, kind of, you know, have you have you now developed enough of a working relationship where um, you you can kind of trust him to to deliver that world uh, with, yes, without yeah, much direction? Much. Yeah. And, uh, that's, uh, the artists I tend to work with more and more, or uh, that's how I go on with them. Mm-hmm. I just kind of trust them to go on with it. My scripts aren't super detailed. I kind of know what they're going to produce. And I trust them, you know, people like PG Holden. Well, not PJ, I'm always disparaging PG. Uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, rightly so, he's terrible. And Tiernan Trevelyan, you know, yeah. uh, people like him. And Simon Colby, people like, I like to work with again and again. Mm. I just going to write the script and I know what they're going to produce. I'm pretty yeah. confident in them. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned just now about uh, uh, Lee mapping out uh, the environment. Um, I'm curious what effect that had you, on you as a writer, because normally, you know, you, you carry this stuff in your head, or you know, I don't know if you sketch a rough idea of where things are out, just in, in case it gets too complicated. But um, uh, what was what was the effect of actually being able to to see and walk, essentially walk through the environment on your on the way that you wrote the series? Uh, well, yeah, normally sometimes there's a problem, kind of. Um choreographing action when you don't actually know what the what the scene's going to look like mm. uh, it was much easier this one especially in the last episode of the current series um there was, there was quite a bit of choreographed action and i had to know who was here and the model was really, really useful in that respect mm. um, even i think added something into it that wasn't the original model mm. okay. we'll see if anyone notices it appears between episodes <laughs> <laughs> and um with uh uh well, one one thing I, I I was curious about when I when I was just sort of coming up with some questions was, um, Joe Dredd especially has almost forty years of continuity behind it, which uh, you know John and 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 Alan and and various other people have either uh, played on or ignored or twisted or or, or whatever. Is there sometimes a, a risk? That uh, uh, that by going back, you're just kind of churning over, um, you know, the same characters. Because as you say, that you felt the, the 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 angel characters have been have been played out. Um, can can you re- return too often to 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 the source? Uh, yes, you can, um, and so I'm trying not to do in this. But basically, we're erasing continuity. I know people will run screaming to the hills at the sound of that, um, <laughs> and kind of rewriting it. So, uh, as I say, the, the things won't the things won't happen the way you think they're going to happen. I think in Angelic, right? Uh, if or it might be alternate timeline. Uh, there's I mean, a saying that I, I, I heard once uh, about comics, and so says continuity ties your best writers to your worst writers. You know, you're obliged to, so I don't necessarily feel bound by that. Mm, okay, okay. And um, uh, looking at, aside from, uh, from, from Angelic for a moment, um, more Absalom in the future? Uh, yes, there's a collection out next year, so we yes. better finish it off. I think it's head. It looks like it's heading towards a conclusion. Absalom. Okay. Um, uh, Tira and I have talked about it. Uh, I know he's doing something else at the moment, uh, and I'm doing about sixteen other things. But it will be. It will see a conclusion in the you know in the foreseeable future, and we'll pension off old Harry. You know, yeah. send him off to his dotage. <laughs> I mean, is that important for you as a writer to to to, to be able to kind of shuffle these? People often park them somewhere. Um, I, I, I don't know. I see this terrible fear of going on and on and just writing the same thing over and over again. Mm. I think stories should have the, a conclusion, if you know, if if need be. I think we've talked about this before. Mm. You know, maybe I go too far too and just like kill off strips and move on to new things too much. But I, I don't want to be writing absolute 20 years from now because that would be awful (laughs) um the last time uh we talked i think um you mentioned about how you were uh walking away from from uh uh dreadworld stuff because uh you know you you part uh cursed earth coburn you weren't going to be writing judge dread anymore um and yet 
you know, Angelic is still set in that, that world. It's still got judges. Um, it, it's it's still you know uh, part of that 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 that, that Barbara, universe. It's its own separate continuity. <laughs> it it's, it's my little sub universe. Right. It doesn't necessarily is uh, and because it's set in the past as well. It's not affected by any you know giant mega events are going to happen. Right. Right. Okay. So so we, we, even though uh, you've got uh, actual judges walking around, it's uh, it it it's a, a well, different well, world in the first season i'm not That's anticipating good. seeing many judges now on right okay all right fair enough, fair enough okay well lovely well thank you very much for coming on the the Philcast again uh gordon um really for enjoying sure. angelic and uh, i i yeah having just revisited all of the angel gang stuff uh when i was writing a feature um it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see where you take it many thanks to Gordon for that. Now, talking about Texas City, it seems to be in vogue at the moment because uh, Michael Carroll's Every Empire Falls is a collection that's out at the beginning of next year, uh, which collects together um, his stories from uh, earlier this year in which Mega City One found itself uh, the victim of an attempted coup. Uh, if you've not read it, then I really do recommend uh, either going to your back issues or picking up uh, Every Empire Falls because um, it's very interesting to see a, a relatively new writer to 2080 um, doing something uh, interesting and different uh, with the post Day of Chaos world uh, in Judge Dread. So uh, just in time for Every Empire Falls to come out in paperback on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, a new series by uh, by uh, Michael Carroll begins in 2000 AD with an accompanying story in the magazine uh, where he's kind of picking up some of the threads of that. And so, uh, yeah, really pleased to be able to welcome Michael onto the Thrillcast to uh, explain and to talk a little bit more about it. Welcome, Michael. Thank you very much, Michael. It's, it's, it's lovely to be here. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So um, we're looking uh, a bit ahead. We're, we're, we're still just at the end of November, uh, but we're looking ahead to January when you have uh, a new Dread story coming out. Do you want to just tell us a, 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 a kind of like the, the elevator pitch for, for this new series? Yeah, the elevator pitch, it, it, it follows on from the, the Every Empire Falls uh, saga, or as someone else called it online, the stealth saga, because we kind of stuck that in without people realising <laughs> Um so yeah, we didn't pre-announce that one. And this is um, it's it's I suppose it's an eight parts um, eight episode tale, but it's broken up into into smaller parts. Um, and it it returns to it basically brings Dread back to Texas City hmm. to sort out a few things. Well, you know how a spoiler spoiler phobic I am. I'm I'm don't want to give away too much, but I will say that it introduces a brand new character who I had an absolute ball writing hmm. and. I, if if everybody else doesn't adore her, then they're wrong and I'm right. Um, I think um, so. It's 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 a it's a one off. I don't know. It's a short term character, but we'll see what happens on that. Obviously, she should get her own TV show and um, so forth, and I can get money. But uh, yeah, so that's one of the things that happens. But effectively, we're we're going back to Texas City. So mm. That's the key here okay okay and and um you i mean you mentioned uh uh, the every empire falls uh epic uh serial whatever you want to call it um uh it's coming out uh, this new series starts just in time for the uh, uh for the collection of every empire falls uh coming out in uh, in paperback um for those who haven't read it uh, uh, or 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 don't remember all the details do you want to just kind of summarize roughly what happened in in those kind of interconnected stories yeah sure the uh, the the collection was the the idea was that it um the mighty Tharg contacted me and said, you know, we wanted to do a, a dread story that crossed over into the magazine. But as, as um, previous uh, older readers will recall, uh, crossovers with the magazine and the pub can be tricky, partly because uh, of the schedule thing. Uh, if, if an issue of the magazine is delayed by a bit or something, then, you know, you get problems with the stories appearing out of order. Um, now, Mike, you're probably way too young to remember a story called Judgment Day. Way, way back. <laughs> but barely, <laughs> uh, is it like uh, early childhood? Yes. Well, Judgment Day was, was it's a great story. I love it to bits, but it was a nightmare when it was coming out. Uh, the magazine was uh, fortnightly at the time. Hmm. So every two weeks, we got a new magazine with certain episodes. Uh, well, you know, an episode of the 
of the Judgment Day story and every other week, every actual week we got the progs with other episodes and over here in Ireland, you know, the distribution wasn't as, as slick as we might have liked. So it, it just got to the stage where about halfway through, I just gave up reading it and just waited till it was all done and then read them all in one go because I was really crying with frustration going, but, but how can this be? You're jumping ahead an episode and I have to wait till, you know, the new issue comes in. And I, But anyway, we didn't want that to happen with the new epic. So the idea was to have uh, to split the story into two streams. So we get to the end of a five-parter in the prog called the the Grindstone Cowboys. And then something happens. Everybody probably knows, but I won't spoil it anyway, just in case. But from that point on, the story splits into two separate streams, one in the magazine and one in the prog. So the magazine story follows Judge Rico uh, primarily, and um, which was my first chance uh, to, to write him, which was a lot of fun because he's kind of like a mini dread. He's like dreads without the, um, without the grizzle. <laughs> or at least where so much of the uh, the nastiness. And um and then the prog story follows Judge Joyce, who is my own creation, uh, mostly. And um yeah, so that gave us two separate stories that then sort of link up at the end. So that was uh that was quite it was actually a lot of fun to plan out and and uh, and you know, figure out how it, how it all joins up. Um and of course part of the story uh is that Dredd seemingly gets killed. Because we all know, I mean, he's a comic book character, you know, no one ever really dies in the comics, except for Mark 1. Um, and other, I mean, yeah, hang on, yes, can't get anybody else who ever actually died. Um, I mean, no, wait, Wolf Wolf died, yes, and didn't come back. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so that kept Dredd out of the picture for a few weeks, which was interesting to see, can we carry on, can we have Jewish Dredd stories that don't have Jewish Dredd in them? Is it actually feasible? And it seems to be. So um, there you go. Maybe the old man isn't so indispensable after all. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Is that a hint for what's coming up? No. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just, ooh, all right. Okay. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, it's 22. Maybe Empire Falls comes to 22 episodes, uh, 148 pages. So it was the longest dread thing I've, I've written. But since it was in, in little chunks, it wasn't. Um, it wasn't too bad. It was. It was. Uh, it was tough going. Well, from you, some point, you you mentioned that somebody described it as a stealth saga. Um, do you do you think it, it that is a better way of doing it? Because uh, when, when when you say, "Ah, oh, it's going to be this big epic," and people kind of expect a, a day of chaos style, yeah. uh, uh, you know, mega event, um, is is it easier for you as a writer to to kind of sneak it under the radar to a certain extent? Well, I think so, yeah. I mean, not in terms of sneaking it past the editorial into under the radar, mm. because obviously the Mighty Thark knows all and sees all. <laughs> um, but in terms of, of uh, with, with the, the readers and the fans, um, if you renounce to the fans that there's going to be a big epic, they will sit there with, with their breath held going, go on and entertain me. But if you if you do slide it in and people realise sort of after the fact that it's it's something big, then it's it's a lot easier. I mean, we saw that perfectly with Trifecta a couple mm. of years ago, which is, to my mind, one of the greatest dread stories ever. And, um, I mean, even though I knew what was coming because I had to spill the beans, uh, I knew it was coming up and it was still a, an you know, amazingly well done because nobody knew in advance. You don't have to pre-announce everything. Uh, sometimes it's nice, it's nice to give the, the readers a, a little surprise when they realise that stories are connected or that there's something that they've not really noticed has been bubbling under for a long time. Hmm. So it's, um, it's it, from a writer's point of view, it's also, it's, it's, it's pretty cool as well. You don't want all your, your, your stories spoiled. Sometimes you want the readers to have no idea at all what's coming up. Do you see this, this uh, new story as um, uh, expanding enough to uh, complement every Empire Falls in, in, in a collection of its own? Uh, not yet. It, it's this is only as it's only eight episodes. There's also a two part story happening in in the uh, the magazine. It's these are it's a little sort of coda to what's going on. Um, I, I I there is something I could say, but it would totally it would be a spoiler even if I only gave a hint about it. Let's just say that it's ah um, uh, uh, no. Why do you put me on the spot like this? <laughs> <laughs> it's um no. It's it's stories that that that. Do follow on logically from something if you see what I mean, but I can't say too much. I mean, I, I, probably I would be fired and or shot or both if I gave away. <laughs> too much. 
but it's um, fired out of a cannon yeah, and then shot in mid air. It's a logical progression yeah. of what has gone before. Um, that's all I can say. The end. No, it takes place in 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 Texas, uh, yes. in, te- in Texas City. Um, now, uh, with we've just been talking to, to to Gordon about his his fascination with uh, the cursed earth and with and, and with uh, the kind of uh, redneck way of uh, doing characters where um, sometimes characters can be very one dimensional and based on in in the grand. Uh, Judge Dredd scheme of things, um, uh, British stereotypes about foreign people. Yes. So you, you've you've only got to look at at, at the the way that uh, um, things like uh, Judge Dredd Crusade um, did uh, a lot of the uh, uh, kind of foreign stereotypes uh, as 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 uh, character sheets essentially um, to uh, to see that sometimes it, it can be a little ham fisted it can be uh, a, a bit too uh, on the nose um, do you think you've, you've you've managed to avoid that with with the kind of uh, Texas characters uh, Texas city characters that you've been you've been uh, writing in this series oh, well, I, I think so it, it is it, it is very tempting with a Texas city character to um, to give him a 10 gallon hat and have him say yeehaw and she was good up in the air an awful mm. lot um, and to be honest as a, as a joke in the script this something that doesn't actually appear on on Texas um, there's a character who, who in the first episode of the news story, um, who basically is, is I call him Rodeo Q Hoedown. Um, he's, he basically looks like Boss Hog from the Dukes of Hazard, but that's just in the panel descriptions. He's not, um, he's, he's not a major character by any means, but sometimes you throw that sort of thing in just for fun. Hmm. Um, you can't actually call a character Rodeo Q Hoedown, um, and, and tell he's a Texan unless you, you never want to visit Texas ever in your entire life, you know, <laughs> which uh, I, mean, I do want to go there one day. But uh, yeah, it is, with, with any nationality, it's really hard, um, you know, not to have your, your Scots character say, oh, guy, uh, dialogue courtesy of Ooh, Woolly 1977. Mm. Um, it's really hard not to have British characters saying Cor Blimey and Stone, Stone and Vera Bleeding Crows, mate, um, which actually I did a bit of in the, um, in the um, Every Empire Falls saga, when um, when uh, what's his name, uh, Joyce Joyce is in London, and he nearly gets run over by a um, by a bus, um, and yeah, see the 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 uh, the robot bus driver has to get out the road, you bleed him up it, you know. I can't do the accents, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard enough to do that sometimes just for fun. But if you, every character is like that, then it becomes jingoistic, and mm. it's 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 a bit of a, it's a bit dangerous. I know certainly. In the past, in 2008, there have been cases where um, where certain stereotypes that are not acceptable now were perfectly fine. Then we, we refer to the Blakey Pentax um, mm-hmm. notion. Uh, yeah, you possibly remember that one. Um, so anybody who was, you know, was not um, Caucasian and British and or American tended to be treated with, um, uh, shall we say, um, ham-fisted kid gloves, you know? <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, let's face it. The, the first Emerald Isle story, even though it was written by an Irishman and and drawn by uh, one Irishman, Will Simpson, and another Irishman or another Englishman who lived in Ireland, that's still incredibly racist in terms of you know the way the Irish people are treated. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to go back to the Emerald Isle story was to sort that one out. Um, I mean, the the, the sport gun. You have to be honest. That's you know, <laughs> that was just. It was funny. And we thought it was hilarious, but at the same time we're going, ah, here, lads. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, that's in, that's interesting. Because, uh, do, do you think that uh, it does make a difference if uh, a, a, a character that plays on national stereotypes is written by somebody of that nationality? Yeah, I, I think it does. I know it doesn't, the character doesn't have to be written by someone of the nationality to, for it to be a good character. Mm. But... Yeah, I think it makes a difference. I mean, for example, with with the uh, with the Emerald Isle stuff, I gave young Judge Joyce, the, the Judge Joyce Junior. I gave him a, what I'd say to be a more rounded Irish personality. I mean, basically, he's he's a bit sarcastic. He's he's good at his job, but that's because he's a judge, not because he's Irish. Um, he's a, he's a bit sarcastic, and everywhere he goes, he seems to meet someone that he knows. 
And that's certainly true of any Irish person I've ever met. I mean, you know, I, I was in New York and I met a guy from primary school who I hadn't seen in like 30 years. And it was like, oh, there's so-and-so. Oh, grand. I was just chatting, chatting to him as if I'd only met him the day before. Right. So things like that happen um, in real life. And the Irish people tend to be very laid back. But we don't, oddly enough, we don't talk about leprechauns and Guinness. And we don't say the Jays and Bigora. And we don't say that dreads the queer fella and the thing. Nobody talks like that to to, uh, to paraphrase that quite maybe. Um, something like that. But... Uh, so imagine if I mean if I was writing a Scots person, I'd have to be careful not to to make him too stereotypical. But Gordon, who I, who I believe is um, actually Scottish, and um, and nothing wrong with that. Nobody has to die because of it. He's a nice fella, I imagine. But I mean, he would have a much better idea of exactly how uh, a Scots person would would be. Whereas I'd still only have my my second hand interpretation. Mm. So that said, when we're 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 a very small nation over here in Ireland, so. Um, if we're writing about Americans, we're more likely to get it right than Americans writing about us because they only have the stereotypes to go on. We have a huge amount of American culture that we can draw upon. Hmm. Uh, with, so, to, I mean, talking about that, do you think with with Texas because of its um, uh, it, it's the, the stereotype of it being independently minded, obsessed with guns and eating meat and all this and the other? Do you think it's very easy to make them? the bad guys in, 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 in a story. Yes, it is. Um, and, and that's something that I, I definitely tried to, to look at um, with these, with these stories is that individually, yes, they can be bad or good, but as a whole, I mean, the Texan people don't know what's going on inside Texas more, any more than the average person knows what's going on outside their own town. You know, you have a, a glimpse of it. So it's, um, it's it's easy to yeah it's easy to make them the bad guys but uh, I can't say who the who the bad guys are in this lot yet but there's a there is a one of these stories which and I've actually got it online I can't remember the titles of anything I'm so bad these days or maybe um, there is a um, no it doesn't matter um, there is one of these stories within this new. Um, bunch where we go a bit outside Texas to something that's quite extreme, and it's um, the the people who the people who I present as the bad guys don't see themselves as the bad guys. But of course, that's probably true of all the baddies. All the best baddies don't know they're they're evil. Mm. Um, and, you know, I've had in my mind for a long time. I mean, in my in my superhero books and things like that, the 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 villains think they're the good guys. They think that what they're doing is right, and that's. Usually the best way. I mean, nobody sits there in real life rubbing their hands together going, ha, 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 I'm evil. Um, at least very few, very few of us do. So it's, uh, yeah, in this case with the Texans, there's a few of them who are bad and a few of them who are good. But of course, it all depends on where you're standing. <laughs> <laughs> um, with uh, uh, the stories you did about um, the rebuilding of Mega City 2 and now this one where, um, you know, spoilers... For anybody who's listening, spoiler, spoiler, spoilers. Um, where Mega City One have essentially imposed their own choice of administration on Texas City after the failed coup. Um, do you? It, it feels very much like you're you're kind of picking up some of the threads, some of the pieces left by John Wagner after the Day of Chaos, um, and and deciding to that the interesting stuff is happening outside of the city to a certain extent. Yeah, well, I think that's important because there's it, it's it's um it's very easy for for uh, the, the people in Mega City One, for example, to assume that Mega City One is Earth. Mm. Um, and we, again, we learn this in, in Ireland. We're very much aware of this from um, because we we sort of the small nation looking in at the rest of the world. We 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 go. You know, I mean, I'm assuming you, you, you people over in Britland as well get this. When you look at the Americans, you, you go see the Americans. Oh, America is not Earth. There is more going on. So when Mega City One, yes, terrible things happen. It's it's chaotic. It's awful. Everything bad ever happens to Mega City One because there's a a giant um, evil lodestone underneath the city that draws all the evil to it or something. No, there isn't, but there will be. I'm putting that in. Um, so I thought, well. When I was um, looking looking at the the the, uh, the story to begin with, I just thought, well, you know, what about Texas City? I mean, they they did nothing to help Mega City One during the Apocalypse War, um, nor to Mega City Two, but they're not really a go of concern. So I, I said to myself, well, it's a huge city, and it was Mega City Three at one point, 
So there's obviously hundreds of millions of people there doing nothing, having going on with their own lives. Well, you know, let's um, let's draw them in back into Dread's world. I mean, it's 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 odd for that Dread can go off to other planets and so on, but doesn't actually visit his his uh, city next door too often. So I decided that's um, that's where we go. And and then of course it, when we get to the idea that Meg City one are kind of Meg City three slash Tech City is kind of isolationist. Uh, then we have to see, well, why are they like that? Um, and they're like that because they believe that they're right about everything and that they're the best. Uh, I mean, obviously not individually, but collectively. In the same way that the Americans, uh, the modern-day Americans, bless them, much as we love them, they will do things like talk about um, America as being the leader of the free world. And the rest of the free world is going, uh, sorry, you're who again? Why are you the leader all of a sudden? Um so same same kind of process. It's the uh, the egocentric thing that a lot of big nations have. When you've got when you've got the biggest stake, you think that you're the, the one who's in charge. Everybody else is going. Well, you might have the bigger stake, but you know we're sitting over here, you know, with our uh, nuclear weapons and so forth. We might be the biggest, but we might be having the most power. So again, it's a uh, matter of where you stand. Well, it's it, it's it's uh, an interesting foil to the stuff that that uh, I think Gordon was doing in in around about the two thousands. Um, which was uh, Mega City One projecting its power um, it, onto other cities. So you had regime change, which which was all about um, and them them uh, influencing both uh, subtly and not so subtly their sphere of influence in in in, in the Americas. Um, whereas now a much more weakened Mega City One um, is having to deal with a world that's that's actually a lot more hostile to it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it's because everything that Mega City One has done is now starting to come back to them. And there's, you know, they they basically they they can pay back for all of the um the the imposition uh, that they've imposed. Can't impose the imposition. Well, that thing on the rest of the world. So that's why in um a couple of times in in, in my more recent stuff that you know it's been mentioned that Mega City One does not have the teeth that it once had. Mm. However. Situation again. Spoilers for those people who've not yet read um, *The Empire Falls*. The what's going to happen is um, *Meg City* one is they were they were in a very weak position. *Meg City* three or *Texas City* tried to take over, mm. and that coup utterly failed to the point where uh, now *Texas City* effectively is in the hands of *Meg City* one. So *Meg City* one does have some teeth again, not quite its own teeth, but it has teeth of some kind. Um, but as yet, no one really knows. So, I mean, obviously, I'm playing a very, very long game here. At some point, Mega City One will obviously return to being quite powerful, uh, because otherwise, they'd be just to be underdogs forever, and we can't have that. Mm. So, um, if, and if, if a city you know that was powerful then falls and then returns to power, do they still have the same arrogance that they had before, or are they more arrogant? And that's what we need to explore in, in you know in coming years, assuming that I'm allowed to. Well, so, that, that was going to be my next question, was was um, not many writers have had the opportunity to actually do long-form storytelling because because John's always, uh, 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 you know, been the primary, apart from the phase in the 90s where it was Garth, um, John's always been the primary writer, uh, often with Alan uh, on, on Judge Dredd, but having the space to develop these threads must be quite, um, I don't know, is, is it a blessing or is it a curse? Um, I think it's well. It's it's both. It's 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 a it's a poison chalice, but nevertheless, the chalice is made of chocolate, which is nice. <laughs> the, um, the 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 it it is a, it's a curse in a way because well, of course, partly because I mean I'm I'm still standing on the shoulders of giants here, and I'm not necessarily <laughs> facing in the right direction. Um, with John, I mean, I still don't know. I mean, John could turn around and destroy everything that I've been setting up. Um, I've got a lot of things like bubbling under. Uh, I think a lot of writers do things that you know. If they come to fruition, then I can look back to the past and say, see, that's where I set the seeds. And if they don't come to fruition, I just say nothing. Um, so it's possible John could turn around and, and, and um, change absolutely everything. And in some ways, he did that with Day of Chaos. I had a few things on the boil, and Day of Chaos came along and, and messed things up. But be- from the ashes of that, I got some, well, you know, the, uh, the ashes lead to very fertile soil, if you like. So I got some, some much better stories than I would have otherwise. But he could turn around and do it again. Um, and that's, well, I, I mean, I, I don't think he would, he would do it maliciously. Um, but I think he might, you know, he, he's not necessarily um, going to ask our permission. <laughs> but we would have to ask his if we want to do something drastic. Mm. So 
I think it's uh, yeah, it, it might happen that John will, will change things, um, and that's that's fine. I I'm, I'm happy with that because you know opportunity uh, or chaos, chaos brings opportunity. So as we saw, actually very literally with uh, Day of Chaos. Um, you mentioned a, a new character, and without going into the the, the specifics of them, um, I, I guess that's also a, a, a sign of a certain degree of freedom within, as being a, 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 a with being a Judge Dead writer, is the ability to introduce supporting characters, and and it, it's been fascinating over the, the the last couple of decades to see. Um, yourself and Rob Williams and Cy Spurrier and, and you know various other writers Al Ewing various other writers um, introduce their own little casts of supporting characters so they don't necessarily have to play with John's toys they've, they've got their own toy box to play in well sure we kind of in a way we kind of have to do that because we don't know what John's planning mm. uh, John could come up with, you know, he could kill off one of his characters. I mean, he might kill off, say, Judge Bean, for example, which means that, you know, we can't necessarily, I don't think he will, but we can't necessarily write stories using her. That said, with the Every Empire Falls story, I got to use Beanie and, and Giant and people like that who I'd never had a chance to use before um, because I asked permission. Um, and I also got a chance to use um, Cursed Earth Coburn, who's been one of my favourite characters ever <laughs> in the comic Um so thank you, Gordon. Because um, Gordon's finished writing Coburn, so he said it was, you know, he was happy for me to to take a poke at him. But um, it's with 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 our own characters. I mean, yeah, we can we can take them further in a way because we don't because no one else is playing with them. Though myself and Rob Williams have talked about this uh, occasionally before that we do need to um, we should kind of collaborate a bit closer on these things. I mean, maybe. I use one of his characters, and use use one of mine, or maybe I tie into one of his storylines a, a bit. Um, well, a bit more carefully because it, otherwise, it, you know, it can read like we're not paying attention to what's going on. I need to reference stuff that he does in the comic. He should reference what I do, and and of course, uh, same with um, all of the other uh, writers. We need to be more um, cohesive. But at the same time, the fact that we are kind of fluid means that, uh, and, and there's no sort of overarching um, boss dictating exactly what can and can't be done. It gives us a lot more freedom and that freedom allows us to come up with ideas that we, otherwise we wouldn't uh, wouldn't even dream of. I mean, for example, all the stuff that Rob did with uh, Titan and Enceladus or however you pronounce that. I mean, if um, if we'd all had a big committee a meeting and a big discussion about it, we would have said, oh, that might not be, you know, we might not want Mega City 1 to freeze, this kind of thing. Mm. Uh, and that would have been bad because that was a great story. I mean, it's an amazing story. So, uh, the freedom allows us um, a certain amount of, of um, how would you put it? Uh, La- latitude? Yes, I suppose. La- latitude, yeah. And, and it gives us room to experiment where otherwise we mightn't. Mm. And from those experiments, sometimes we get good things. So that's it for another 2000 AD Thrillcast. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And thank you to everyone who uh, not only has given some wonderful, wonderful feedback uh, about the podcast, but also uh, tunes in every two weeks and uh, helps spread the word about uh, the galaxy's greatest podcast. Um, We shall be back in two weeks' time. So do not touch that dial, Earthlets. Stay with 2000 AD, stay with the Thrillcast, and uh, until next time, Splendid Verthwick. But wait! There's more. Don't forget that 2000 AD is published every Wednesday and is available in newsagents and comic book stores in the UK and around the world. It's also available digitally from 2000 AD's web shop and apps. We have apps for Apple devices, Android devices, and Windows 10 devices. And if you buy any of our products on one of the apps, you can download it DRM free. So no copyright protection on there to stop you reading it on other devices direct from the web shop when you use the same login. You can also go to the web shop and apps and get our latest collections. If you subscribe to the print edition of 2000 AD, then not only do you get it several days earlier through your letterbox, but you will beat the price rise. So uh, make sure that you uh, grab a subscription ASAP before the post Prog 2000 price rise comes in. Also, if you go to our apps and subscribe, 
to 2000 AD and all at the Judge Dread magazine, then you get access to a range of back issues plus a load of free comics. So make sure you go along to www.2000adonline.com and either click through to the shop and the subscriptions page or click on the relevant button for the apps. Also be sure to keep up with 2000 AD on our other social media. We are on Twitter as at 2000 AD. We are on Facebook. Just type in facebook.com forward slash 2000 AD. Uh, we also have our YouTube channel where you can check out the latest Thrillcast, but also the 2000 AD ABC, the alphabetical journey through the galaxy's greatest comic, which goes out every week. And uh, that is www.youtube.com forward slash 2000 AD online. We're also on Instagram as Insta 2000 AD and on all of these platforms you get not only the latest 2000 AD news but also uh, competitions, lots of fun stuff from the archives and what's coming up. If you definitely want to keep up to date on what's happening with 2000 AD make sure you sign up to the Thrill Mail which goes out every Wednesday. If you go to www.2000adonline.com forward slash thrillmail, that's all in word, thrillmail, T-H-R-I-L-L-M-A-I-L, and put your details in there, then uh, you'll get a weekly thrillgasm into your inbox from the 2000 AD command module. That's all for this week. Splendig Verthrig Earthlets. 